Over the many ages that make up the Zelda series, the hero in green, and most recently in blue, Link, has taken on a wide variety of evils plaguing the land of Hyrule. Not just your average ground level monsters, but much more powerful foes in the form of bosses. From demonic monstrous eels to infernal beasts hotter than Death Mountain itself, to the stuff of pure fantasy like actual dragons fought in midair. It's fair to say that the Zelda series knows how to do enemies, especially the boss battles. Whilst Breath of the Wild stepped away from the traditional format of bosses, instead having more of a focus on overworld bosses and enemies, the evils from the past have not gone forgotten. The bosses from the past often have an untold story behind them, pieces of lore and history not fully known to the player, and one boss that screams mystery to me is Stalard. The Twilight Fossil of the Arbiter's Grounds This colossal titan of a skeleton is the boss of the fourth dungeon in Twilight Princess, the Arbiter's Grounds, and whilst based on first impressions, Stalord may seem like nothing more than a badass epic boss fight, there is actually a lot of history about this foe that we don't know. Why is Stalord here? What did Stalord look like alive and in the flesh? And the big one? What is Stalord? That is today's video. Be sure to go grab yourself a snack or drink and let's dive into the mystery of the origins of the mighty Twilight Fossil, Stalord. To begin, we will briefly analyse Stalord and the surroundings we find the beast in. When Link first enters the room we find Stalord in, we can see that this is some sort of chamber, a massive cylindrical room with a dipping pit of sand at the bottom. Upon making our way down the sand, we get our first proper look at Stalord. We can see the stagnate remains of some sort of large beast, a massive skull, spine, ribcage and a demonic claw breaching the sand. Once Link walks right up to the remains, his newfound rival Zan appears and stabs the skull of this beast with the scimitar of twilight, resulting in the reanimation of the monster. Not to be confused with resurrection, which we will cover later in the video for a much bigger reason. After Zant vanishes, the beast begins to rise from the depths of the sand. What looked like a few broken bones on the surface emerges into a titan of a skeleton with corrupt red demonic eyes, with the scimitar of twilight still lodged into the skull. We can take a few things from this view of Stalord. After rising from the ground, we can see that the beast has long arms equipped with claws at the end, which will be useful information to know later in the video. The torso and spine build are rather generic and normal, so there isn't much to take from that, but one of the most important skeletal features to know is the skull. We get a few good shots of the skull, both from the front, sides and behind. We can see there is a sort of ridged spike feature going down the skull, which would connect to the spine. The beast also has large fang teeth, almost like saber teeth, likely having smaller ones when it was alive, but due to the size of these fangs, they've remained intact. This is important for making connections to the other beasts later. Then there is also the doubled horn-like features which curl and rise to the back of the skull, inverted horns if you will, which is incredibly important to note so be sure to keep that in mind also. It's a small detail but there also seems to be some sort of metal poles or worn down blades penetrating the skull. There is a second phase to the battle which is incredibly awesome, but it doesn't give us any new skeletal features to note, although we do learn Stalord can now shoot fireballs at us, indicating towards this monster being some sort of fire based enemy in the past, but we'll discuss that more shortly. Moving away from Stalord directly, as previously mentioned, the location Stalord is found within is this massive chamber. At first it's filled with sand, but as the second phase of the fight commences, the sand drains and reveals a spinner slot, which projects a massive tower with spinner rails that are used to fight Stalord on in mid-air. This reveals to us that the chamber has a ton of sand below it, possibly meaning Stalord was formerly a sand type enemy, but I personally believe that the sand was more of a containment method. But that's just me personally, and I will explain later why I think this. Other details we can note about this place is that the chamber is in fact very out of the way to reach, 
and has a sort of grand entrance. This could mean the chamber was planned for containing large monsters, as this was a prison after all, and enemies do pose and enemies pose a threat to Hyrule, but the fact that it is very distant from the heart of the prison could indicate the threat Star-Lord posed was a great one compared to all other enemies, which will be used as a connection point shortly. We do also need to remember that the Arbiter's Grounds was the prison for the worst of the worst, built far out in the Gerudo Desert which is extremely hard to access in this iteration of Hyrule, meaning Stalord was definitely one of the most terrifying and threatening beasts of its time. On top of that, moments before Zant reanimates Stalord, he says the following to Link, For I fear this is the last time I will see you alive. Which, Wills could just be an intimidation tactic, it could also mean Zan knows the dangers of a live, living Stalord. How would he know this, you may ask? Well, it's possible that when Ganondorf was banished to the Twilight Realm and teamed up with Zan, he was made aware of the tools to use in their planned takeover, with Stalord being the most deadly one, a tool for their plan. Now that we have a full understanding and analysis if you like, we can begin comparing it to monsters of the past and see if there are any relevant connections. The obvious things to look for are size and shape. Stalord is clearly huge compared to the size of Link, so we are realistically looking at Stalord being some sort of dragon or Dodongo, two of the largest known creatures in the Zelda series. You could argue the possibility of Leviathans being on the card here, but the skeletal features don't really match up, as Leviathans known to the series don't typically have fanged saber teeth for claws. Firstly, we should look at a creature found in the same game as Stalord, the Twilight Dragon, Argorok. This soaring beast of the skies is the boss to the seventh dungeon in the game, the City in the Sky, and shares some similarities to our land-born friend Stalord. Argorok has a body build kind of similar to Stalord, a narrow and sharp skull, followed down by a prominent ribcage. The dragon also has claws, but they appear to be on the feet, whereas Stalords seem to be more hands. These could have been wings, but Argorok's wings don't seem to have any claws at all, and rather are just simply wings. So I think that writes off Argorok. It's a good shout, but unlikely. Next, Valu. Now, before we write this one off because Valu is seen as a deity and general nice guy, <coughs> dragon, there could be a connection in terms of species. Looking at Valu's shape and structure, it's clear there aren't any obvious connections, but there is one I wanted to point out, the skull. Valu shares that same inverted horn feature as Stalord. Although it's only a single row or set, it is an identical feature, so it's worth mentioning but it's still unlikely to connect the two fully. Thirdly, and in my opinion most interestingly, Volvagia, the subterranean lava dragon of the Fire Temple, Ocarina of Time's fifth dungeon. The similarities between Stalord and Volvagia are insane. The lava dragon of Death Mountain is a long serpent dragon infused with the element of fire, most notably seen with its red mane of flames. Volvagia shares four key details to Stalord. They both have clawed fangs. Yes, Volvagias are much smaller, but that will be explained soon, just hold on. They both share those inverted, sharp horns coming out from their skull, and while some may argue that the skull and horns of Volvagia is more of an armour plate to protect its face, that isn't exactly true. If you look at the dragon's claws, we can see that they are an identical texture and design to the skull, meaning it's more than likely part of the dragon, an exterior skull that has developed onto the dragon as they've evolved over time, as it's needed for their survival. They also both share the element of fire, and whilst you could argue that Stalord is found in the sandy dunes of the Gerudo Desert, remember, the Arbiter's Grounds is a prison, meaning Stalord very well could have been brought here. Stalord can shoot fireballs. Then there is the fourth connection. They were both brought back to life in one way or another. 
In the events of Ocarina of Time, after Ganondorf takes over Hyrule, he resurrects the ancient dragon Volvagia to threaten the Gorons who stood up to Ganondorf's reign over Hyrule. The King of Evil brought the ancient legend of a beast back to life and imprisoned the Gorons within the Fire Temple, and further threatened to feed them to the dragon Volvagia to show them who's boss and to send a message to any other races or groups who dare defy his reign over Hyrule. Ganon was a gutsy man, he was not messing around. Stalord was reanimated by Xan, who was under the wing of Ganondorf in order to take out Link and ultimately Hyrule. Could Ganondorf seen in Twilight Princess somehow have known about the legend of Volvagia and what his descendant incarnation in Ocarina of Time did, inspiring him to find a similar beast or further, a relative beast to threaten Hyrule with again? Knowing Twilight Princess takes place many ages after Ocarina of Time, evident by the state of the hero Shade who is the same link from Ocarina of Time, could the species of dragon that Volvagia is have either evolved or lived on for years to come? I believe that's very possible. I am not saying Volvagia and Stalard are one for one copies of each other, but I do believe they are part of the same family of dragons. The best way to prove my point and evidence here is through the identification of dinosaurs. Yes, you heard that right. You see, dinosaurs were typically identified by each other by their body features, similar to how us humans do now, but it was to a much greater extent with our dino friends. Many dinosaurs differentiated their gender by body features such as horns or external skull features. For example, many female dinosaurs had larger hips. Some species had either longer or shorter jaws, tails, and you guessed it, horns. These defining features were even used for mating charms, which we won't dive in depth to as I'm sure you can figure out how that works. The main point here is that whilst many dinosaurs looked very different, you could often tell if it was part of the same family through its skeletal structure and features. Look at Volvagia and Stalard. They both share that identical inverted horn, both appearing like armour for their face. Along with that, they both have clawed hands, and from what we can see, a lack of feet. On top of all of that, they both share the element of fire. It's just more noticeable with Volvagia as it was resurrected into its living form. Stalard is, well, a stall enemy, the lord of the stall enemies made of bones but still showing its fire traits during the fight against Link. Could the story of Stalard's reanimation and fight with Link be an insanely deep and hidden reference to the events of and story of Volvagia and its resurrection? No, that's rather unlikely, but would be awesome. Rather, I believe that Stalard and Volvagia are in fact connected by species. I think that they are both part of the same family of fire dragons. They look different in terms of size and extrusion of certain body parts, however, their features do add up really well. Like the dinosaur point earlier, they can look different but be part of the same family which is definable through their skeletal features. To add to that, Death Mountain seen in Twilight Princess technically lacks a true enemy, as the boss is a corrupt Goron under the control and influence of the infectious Twilight. The mountain's dungeon, the Goron Mines, does not have an evil boss, and now that we know Stalord is the remains of a fire dragon, we could say that Stalord once resided within Death Mountain, similar to how Volvagia once did many ages ago. Now, some of you may ask, what about the inverted horns on Valu? Well, Valu could be part of the same family of fire-based dragons, or even a branch off within the same family tree, which resulted in a different body, arms, legs and tail, but kept that feature of inverted horns coming from the skull. Valu just happened to be a deity similar to the dragons seen in Skyward Sword. To conclude and wrap things up, I believe that the Twilight Fossil Stalord in its prime was in fact a relentless fire dragon akin to Volvagia, so much so that Stalord and Volvagia are part of the same family of fire dragons, but due to Stalord being on the larger and stronger side of their family tree of species, it was contained inside the Arbiter's grounds in a far, deep chamber, flooded with sand to hold the beast down and inevitably take it out resulting in us finding it is nothing more than the remains of a dragon.
Thanks a lot for watching this video, I really hope you enjoyed it. If you did, be sure to drop a like and subscribe for more Smashing Zelda content. What do you think? What is the Twilight Fossil Star-Lord? Be sure to leave a comment down below with what you think about the origins of Star-Lord and if I missed anything. I look forward to reading your comments. Huge thanks to all of my wonderful Patreon supporters for your generous support. It really helps me to make these videos as often as possible. If you'd like to become one of my Patrons and get your name featured at the end of every one of my videos, then feel free to check out my page through the card in the top right or link in the description. Again, thanks for watching, and until the next time, I've been Hyrule Gamer.